every single shot was like art. Oh, I thought this was going to be a one-dimensional movie. This franchise is one of the few franchises that consistently gets better and better and better. Every movie seems to be setting up for a sequel. It felt like a three-hour movie. I guess so. Today's a bit of a different video. I want to go through all of the films I've seen this year so far and rank them. Near the start of this year, I decided to get a Cine World card because there is so many movies coming out, at least this year, that I'd had my eye on. Things like The Dead Rise, John Wick, Megan. There's just been so many that I've been tempted by. This is not obviously an ad. This is just, I wanted to give you my reasoning as to why I've seen so many because this is a lot to see. And obviously, if you're paying for a ticket for each of these, it would be ridiculously expensive. But because I have that card, and as long as I'm seeing minimum two movies a month, I'm getting my money's worth. So, just wanted to clarify that. Also, I am not a movie snob. I like what I like. I like horror movies that are not filled with jump scares. I also adore action movies. Didn't realise I was such an action fan until I was going through all of the movies that I've seen this year and realising the majority of movies that I love are either horror or action filled. Yeah, that's what you're dealing with. This is just my personal preference for movies. I'm going to give you the things that I thought were really good about the movies, the things I think could have done better, and my personal opinion of how possibly they could have done them better, at least, again, in my personal opinion, as an avid movie watcher. And also, I'm going to, obviously, I'm going to mention some of my favourite actors or characters in each of the movies that I think did a really good job of possibly stealing the scenes or in some cases stealing the whole movie themselves. I hope you guys all enjoy this video. If you do, make sure to give us a like. But let's get into it. Some of this is going to be controversial of like what my favourite is and what some of my lowest rated are. So 16 movies I'm going to talk about in total. And when I was going through it, I actually couldn't even believe some of these were lowest rated. The first one, which is actually the last rated, is Dungeons and Dragons. I think it's called Honor Among Thieves. I think it's because I had such high hopes for this movie. The trailer looks very entertaining, but I feel like it gets lost from other adventure movies, in my personal opinion. There are some really good characters, like for example, Sophia Willis did a really, really amazing job. Even Michelle Rodriguez, I really, really liked her character. Yes, she plays very similar characters in a lot of the movies she plays in, but I genuinely thought those two and I mean, I do love me a strong, independent, female, badass character. Maybe because that's what I try to portray on a daily basis. Especially Sophia Willis's character. I think hers was very magical character. But yes, yeah, so at the start of this movie, I found the constant chain of scene. And it wasn't just like, oh, from the bar to outside the bar to like someone's home. It wasn't something like that. It was literally from like place to place to place to place. And it was just, after about five or six of those, I just thought, I feel like we're just constantly moving from place to place. Can we just get on with the story now? That could be because that's a Dungeons and Dragons reference. And that has gone completely over my head because I've never played Dungeons and Dragons. The only thing I know of Dungeons and Dragons is from the Big Bang Theory. If there is something like that, it's going to go completely over my head. The only one reference I genuinely got was when they were talking about um, having to cross a bridge and it being like really complex set of instructions and rules for crossing this bridge. There is a precise formula we must follow so as not to trigger the mechanism. What's the formula? It's quite simple. Starting from the center, use odd numbered blocks only, moving forward with each step except for every fifth step, which must be a lateral move. Left or right, it matters not, so long as the leader and the laggard remain equidistant, after which proceed. Again, odd numbered blocks only. However, at the midpoint, we switch to even numbered blocks. Same pattern except now lateral move after the fourth step. That hit home. Immediately, I knew that was to do with Dungeons and Dragons. That was specific to it. But the rest, if there was anything, yeah, that would have flown completely over my head. It's a fun story. It's a good entertaining thing. If it was someone put it on the background, I wouldn't tell them to turn it off. I can be entertained by most movies. It's just, it was the least entertaining because I felt like they missed a huge trick with this. To me, as a non-Dungeons & Dragons player, I think it would have been hugely entertaining. It could have been funny. It was the start of the movie. could have been a bunch of friends around a table playing Dungeons & Dragons. And then you kind of are inserted into the world of Dungeons & Dragons. And then when a character is doing something weird 
or when you get all those rules for example it could keep flashing back to the real world and then back into Dungeons and Dragons I think that would have been more entertaining it would have been more understanding if people had got the references in that way it could lead more people to play Dungeons and Dragons for example I don't think they hit what I wanted them to and I think that's why it felt disappointing to me. It just felt like it was could have been any adventure movie from any franchise. Ah, oh, that sounds harsh, but it's it's true. So I mean, I gave it a six out of ten. I will say IMDb gave this a seven point three. Me and IMDb clearly don't get on. Clearly don't see eye to eye. Then we have again, people are gonna hate me for this, but at number fifteen for me is Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. The first thing I want to say, I was incredibly impressed at the start of this movie. From the trailer, they showed Indiana Jones as a younger Harrison Ford. I thought that was going to be a minute or two worth of screen time. It wasn't. It was a good 10 to 15 minutes at the start of the movie of young Harrison Ford. To me, that was incredibly impressive. I went into the full movie and it was a good movie. It was entertaining and there was adventure and there was car chases and, and fighting and things like that. And it, it was entertaining. So for me, I think they could have lent further into the this is Harrison Ford's last Indiana Jones. See how Spider-Man did nostalgia. I feel like Indiana Jones could have lent in to that. For example, they could have had a big boulder. I mean, that's the only one I can remember. I haven't seen any other Indiana Jones movies for a minimum 15 to 20 years. So like, I apologize that I'm blanking on any Indiana Jones references, but I feel like there could have been some Indiana Jones references from, maybe there was, maybe I just missed them. But I feel like they could have lent into that nostalgia and it would have made you enjoy it more, I feel like. Because there were great characters. Teddy was an incredible character added to the franchise. I think if they carry on with the franchise as Helena main character or whatever, I hope they carry on and keep Teddy uh, in the franchise as well. Because he, to me, stole every scene he was in. I wanted more Teddy. I thought he was great. Helena, I didn't actually like. I know that she was meant to be a character that you grow to like through the movie because she grows as a character, be like less selfish, etc. But I just didn't like her. I didn't think that she was likable enough for me to want for her to be saved or for her to even be in a new series, I'm going to be honest. And to the point where, and I know it's something really, really small, but it was something that kind of pissed me off about her, was that she was continuously sexualizing men. And maybe it's because it's the 60s and women were consistently sexualized around that time, but women were fighting for equality and yet you're treating a man like a piece of meat when you probably don't want to be treated like a piece of meat. Frustrated me. Yeah, I just didn't like her. And because of that, I don't know if that sort of weighed down the movie for me. Overall, it was still a good movie, similar to Dungeons and Dragons. I enjoyed it as an adventure movie, but I wouldn't go and buy it. I wouldn't necessarily, even if it came on Prime, I wouldn't necessarily choose it, but I would if there was nothing else to watch. Oh, I will say, sorry, I forgot to mention, Chaudet Renee, who was like a police officer, I wanted to know more about her character. Her character seemed incredibly interesting to me, likeable, completely underutilized. So I wish we had had more of her. Oh, something else I forgot to mention. Jesus, I don't know how I forgot this. The lighting. Oh my God. Towards the end of the movie, the lighting and the shots of that movie were like art to me. That's why actually this has come above Dungeons and Dragons. Because actually they're basically, to me, very similar movies. But it was stunning. I wanted to be a photographer when I was 16. I collected cameras as I've gotten older and I truly adored the camera work and the lighting of the end of the movie. That's worth watching. So yeah, so I gave it a 6.5 overall and IMDb gave it a 6.8. So I will say we're that's probably the closest me and IMDb got. Right, so this one I feel like is going to piss people off. <laughs> But it's just my own honest opinion. And this is because, like I said at the start, I am not an Oscar movie lover. By that I mean like Oscar award winners. For example, The Revenant, I 100% understand why Leonardo DiCaprio got his Oscar. I'm sure it was the Oscar for Revenant. Because he had to say so much without literally saying a word. But I thought that movie was incredibly boring. Beautifully shot, boring to watch. And therefore, I found out after that day, I just don't really like Oscar movie winners, okay? It's, they're just not for me. And Oppenheimer is one of these movies. So it comes at number 14, and I know it's probably shocking because it has been one of the most talked about movies this year. And I wanted to like it more, I genuinely did, because I love Christopher Nolan movies. They are shot impeccably. That's something that I loved about this movie, again, why it's coming even higher. The explosion scene, 
Chris Pennell is the only person where your heart can be beating for 45 seconds and the situation is getting more and more and more intense and then it, it happens. And that explosion was, again, art to me. It's the only time a movie theatre, bar maybe a quiet place, although I never went to see that in theatres because I was scared that someone would make a fucking noise. It's the only time in a movie theatre everybody has been fully silent when there also has been no sound from the movie. The people have been quiet in movies before, don't worry. But like the whole movie theatre, including the movie itself, was silent. And then you had the explosion. Nolan did that perfectly. I couldn't think of another director who could have done it that well. The things I didn't like about this movie. I think I was disappointed because I, I think I expected more from a Nolan movie. I thought I was going to be more entertained. It felt like a three hour movie when I thought Christopher Nolan wouldn't make me feel like it was a three hour movie. And I think that's because there's too many characters in too short amount of time. And that is because this is a star studded cast. You've got so many incredible uh, actors and actresses and not just as main characters but as side characters the amount of characters that i saw and i was like oh my god that's the guy that played elliot in will and grace that's josh peck who was in drake and josh josh hartnett you had so many of these side characters it was overwhelming something that a tv series chernobyl did well was that they condensed a lot of scientists real life scientists into one person and because of that it was easier for the audience to follow to understand was it historically correct no but it was easier for the audience and i think that's something could have helped this movie but the other thing that was confusing for me was the fact there was four timelines there were, were certain points especially at the start of the movie i was like hang on a minute is this now and then realizing oh no this is so and so looking back but then that person's also looking back in time. Both of them on the same timeline. It made me confused as someone who was watching it. Maybe this is a movie that you definitely have to go and watch again. But this isn't a movie I would go out of my way to go and watch again. Because it's three hours. This is a movie that could have been two hours, 15 minutes long. Especially considering there are some storylines that I feel like were meant to be a conspiracy. It's got forgotten. Probably because there was so much going on in this movie. So yeah, so I gave it a 7 out of 10. It would have been a six and a half out of ten, but the explosion and the videography pushed it up for me. Whereas IMDb gave this an 8.7, so you can see how me and IMDb just don't understand each other. So, at number 13 for me is Renfield. Similar to Dungeons and Dragons, I went into this movie have higher expectations than probably other movies. Like, for example, Indiana Jones went in with no expectation whatsoever. I thought it's going to be a good movie, but I didn't have really high expectations. There are certain other movies that I thought this is going to be ridiculous, and actually I really enjoyed it. <laughs> My expectations are a whirlwind. Something I think Jeremy John said was that the cop storyline was like a movie that was only 45 minutes long, and the Renfield movie was only about 45 minutes long, and they sort of smashed the two together. That's what it genuinely felt like. It felt like this was an unnecessary part to the movie. And I think it brought the movie down because Nicholas Holt did an amazing job. I forget how good he is at comedic roles like this. And Nicholas Hay has hit his mark with what types of movies he should be doing. He was like a caricature version of Dracula without it being like a one dimensional character. It was so well acted and you missed him when he wasn't on the screen. Whereas Aquafina, this is gonna sound really harsh. I feel like she does the same character, especially when she's a side character, because that's what I've seen her do. Maybe that's just because these are the only roles she's being given. But either way, I feel like she's playing the same character over and over and over again, and they are forgettable characters. For instance, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, he's one of the biggest best paid actors in the world right now as far as I'm aware because he is given role after role because he has found his niche and loves him for it. Aquafina has found this niche but it's a forgettable side character in every single movie she's in and the comedy I, maybe she's just not for me. I think she did a good job in Shang-Chi. I liked her in that. I thought she was forgettable in this and I thought that her character was unnecessary. I feel like it, maybe if her character had been killed off and then 
the main character, Nicholas Holt, had had something like his friend had been killed. It would give him even more incentive to try and kill Dracula or something like that. That could have been a, maybe a better storyline. I don't know. But there was something missing from this Renfield movie. And I think it was the other half of the Renfield storyline. Overall, I gave it a 7 out of 10. And I wouldn't go out of my way to go see it again. Even if it was on Prime. This surprised me. Transformers Rise of the Beasts. I went to go see this because it was nothing else that came out that weekend. I go almost every weekend to go to the cinema. So much to the point that I actually took a week off of work to make sure I could go catch up with movies that came out all within the same week. And there was no way I was going to be able to fit them all into one weekend. That's how dedicated I am to go see movies this year. I was surprised how much I enjoyed this movie. It is better than the original. Maybe not the first one. It gives you the same je ne sais quoi. It was entertaining. The new characters were incredibly likeable. The new bots were very likeable. To the point that the new bots, you forget that a whole scene is, I'm going to use the phrase CGI, the new term it is, it is that good. I think the reason I, f I really enjoyed this one especially is because it wasn't made by Michael fucking Bay. And it shows because this is a more refreshing turn for this franchise that I would definitely go to see the next one. The only thing, and this is something that I've seen so many movies do this year, which is honestly pissing me off. Every movie seems to be setting up for a sequel. This one was setting up for a sequel. You got Fast 10 clearly setting itself up for a sequel. Mission Impossible 7 Part 1 clearly setting up for Part 2. There are very few standalone movies nowadays. Everything has to be a fucking franchise. They literally say that in the screen six. Which is it's so true. Everything has to be franchised. It's not just having a sequel. It's franchising now. People get burnt out with franchises. Let us just have really good stories. And actually, stop remaking shit too, because that gets fucking boring too. Sorry, I know that was a tangent. I gave Transformers a 7, and IMDb gave it a 6.1. Another one that's going to surprise the shit out of you. Number 11, didn't think it was going to come this high. Fast 10. Now, I have shit on Fast and the Furious movies in recent years, because I have refused to go see them. I... Saw up to seven and thought this would have been the perfect end for this franchise. And what did they do? They just carried the fuck on. And I had to watch eight and nine because I thought eight or nine was the Hobbs and Shaw spin-off, which I genuinely really enjoyed, by the way. I went out of my way to go see that one because it was completely separate. And I thought, yeah, side movies, 100% spin-offs could definitely work for the Fast and the Furious franchise. I thought that was eight or nine. So I thought I only had one movie to catch up on. I had to catch up on one the night before and one the morning before I left. And I had like a 10.30 or 11 o'clock movie showing. So I wanted to make sure I was up to date. And the Fast and the Furious franchise has come a bit more down to earth. When they sent people up in space, all of us thought that was absolutely fucking stupid, okay? They didn't need to send a car up into fucking space, okay? That was always stupid. Nine came back down to earth and John Cena actually, I think, did an incredible job as his character in Nine. And he is again in 10. And he does a good job. This movie was completely action-packed. To the point it got lost in its own franchise. And what I mean by that, it's like everyone has different side quests and they all eventually are going to come together, but clearly in the next movie. And because of that, this is not me shitting on Lee, but her and Charlotte Theron's character, their side quest was so unnecessary to the fucking movie. The only reason that was there was so they could set up for a dead character that has come back to fucking life somehow, which they did twice in this movie. Another franchise scared to kill people off. And it is getting fucking old. Like, let people die. Let characters, excuse me, die. Let us feel the emotion of them dying. People even said, like, this with Endgame, they're like, oh, because of all the people that have been brought back to life from other timelines or whatever, still haven't watched Endgame, but I know obviously what happens, Tony Stark could come back. And it's like, no, people felt their grief for those characters. Let that be their story. But now they just keep bringing people back. And it's just like, we need to stop. But yeah, it was good. It was entertaining. I loved Jason Momoa's character in it. He did an incredible job as a villain. He was a very campy villain, like an old school campy villain. And he's the part that you are going to remember. It's still entertaining. I, I do enjoy Fast and the Furious movies. I hate myself for it, but they are entertaining. I forget they are kind of entertaining. They are not the most entertaining franchise on my list. So I gave it a 7 out of 10. 
Yeah, I thought this was harsh. IMDb gave it a 5.9. Number 10. Jeremy Johns. Okay, so, number 10. I feel like people are going to give me shit for my list. <laughs> Is Shazam! Fury of the Gods. Okay, Shazam, I feel like, the first one that came out in 2019. I feel like that was probably one of the best DC movies that have come out in recent years, bar, like, the Joker. I genuinely think that was fun, it was engaging, it was just enjoyable. It was a good movie. It was a genuinely good hero movie I feel like we haven't seen before. A lot of the other movies feel like regurgitated bullshit all the time. But with Shazam, I felt like it was something different. And with the second one, I really enjoyed it. I liked the the turn of them being their adult heroes hanging out because you got to see the kids more in the first one so I felt like it was a good turn to see the adults more in the second one because you only got to see, you know, five minutes of the adult heroes from the first movie. And it gave the actors a chance to really play those characters. Being an adult playing as a child as an adult is like, a, it's kind of a weird way to try and act. And I think each of the actors did a really, really good job. I think that Jack Dylan Grazer was 100% a standout for the movie for me, especially from one of like the, the good guys, the villains. Oh my God, Helen Mirren and Lucy Liu did an impeccable job. Loved them. Loved them in this. The thing that really kind of annoyed me about this mo movie though was it felt like there was three separate endings. Just give us the fucking ending. And I feel like that's because maybe, especially considering there's a surprise cameo literally right at the end, I think maybe one of those was reshot and added in because they wanted to add that cameo in. A cameo of a character that actor has been axed from DC, so don't get me fucking started. My point is, it was a really good movie. The endings just kind of annoyed me. So I gave it a 7.5. I actually gave it a 6. Okay, number 9. There aren't that many Marvel movies in here. You'll be happy to know. But this is one of them. So number 9 is Guardians of the Galaxy 3. So, I loved the first Guardians of the Galaxy. This is the problem when you have such a great start, is almost every single movie that comes as a sequel to the first movie has sequelitis. It always fails to deliver. There's always something. It just hasn't got the same spark. Because you go in with expectations. It's like New Year's. You go out of expectations, you come back disappointed. It's always the same. So with Guardians of the Galaxy 2, watched it in the cinema, never watched it again. Because I didn't like the turn where they were trying to, not demonise Rocket, but like make him as if he was a bit of a, of a dick than we already kind of knew he was in the first one. But he wasn't a lovable dick. That sounds bad. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? And the third movie... Okay, so the first thing is it was very triggering for me. I am a huge animal lover. Seeing animals being tested on, even CGI animals... Every time I saw them, I'm not kidding, every time I saw them, I was struggling to concentrate on the storyline of the movie because it was too hard to watch. Because I've looked after a lot of animals, I've had a lot of animals in my time, and it was triggering for me. Even though I liked this movie, I liked the story of Rocket, I won't watch this again. It was too hard to watch. There were some good fight scenes. A lot of people talk about the hallway which was shown in the trailer. It is good. That sort of Avengers thing where it goes around and shows you each of the characters fighting. But I actually preferred the Star-Lord and Groot fight scene. I thought that was really, really good. You see a little bit of that in the trailer. I, I loved that part. Things that I felt really let this movie down is it felt like it should have been a longer movie. There were storylines that felt completely rushed. There were storylines that got forced into this like the love story between Nebula and Gamora and Star-Lord. The whole love triangle thing where he might be attracted to Nebula or whatever because she's now more the person that Gamora used to be than the new Gamora. That felt completely forced and it got basically forgotten by the end of the movie. I don't even know how to word this but it just felt unnecessary to the rest of this movie. He could have just been more disappointed that Gamora wasn't who she used to be. I don't think you needed to shove Nebula into a love story with Star-Lord considering we never even got any fucking thing from it. Another storyline that felt completely forced out of nowhere was Warlock. Warlock was is a character that was obviously in the Guardians of the Galaxy uh, comic books. I've never read the comic book so I didn't know. And that it was almost like they felt they had to get this character in because he's probably Probably in other Marvel movies coming around in the next couple of years. I don't watch every Marvel movie by the way because I think it's way too saturated now. I, I miss the days of there just being two or three a year at most. Now it is just, it's quantity over quality. 
let's be real. So anyway, Warlock is clearly going to be in some sort of MCU universe at some point. Forced him into this movie, and they forced this character to have development that felt unnatural. And the other thing that this franchise is scared of doing, again, is killing off fucking characters. I don't want to spoil it. There is a character that should have died at the end of this, and they didn't. I think it would have been their perfect ending to this trilogy, especially considering there was already a false fucking person that almost died not even five minutes earlier in the movie. And rather than just ha having that character die and having other characters take over instead, considering they literally basically do that at the end anyway, <sighs> franchises need to recognise that sometimes you have to kill characters off for it to feel impactful. You can't just keep having fake out deaths. You've got to actually kill some characters. It hurts, people have to agree with those characters, but when you recognise that actually they've come, you know, all the way through this story over all of these movies, etc., and this is how their character story ends, sometimes it can be poetry. But no one wants to fucking do it anymore because all they think about is the franchise. For me, I gave it a 7.5, and IMDb gave it an 8.1. Number 8. Screen 6. I'm actually surprised that some of these horror movies weren't higher up and it's just because when I was going through my ratings I realised, oh my god, this one I actually rated way higher. I, I don't know if it's maybe because I was really good mood that day, but I've gone by my original ratings. Scream 6. I haven't seen Scream 5 since I originally watched it. And when I watched 6, I forgot how brutal the killings were. And it's something I genuinely loved about Five. I thought the brutality of the killings was something so refreshing to the series. And that's something great that season six continued to do. The start where you think this person's going to be the killer, but actually, and they showed the face, which Jeremy Johnson did mention, which I think is a really good point. They should one day maybe show who the killer is, or at least one of the killers, for example. And then you're almost following, can they figure out who one of the killers is? Because they're sitting right next to you. A bit like almost Dexter, for example. Like, this is the person you're looking to find and figure out who's killing your friends or who's killing these people. He's in your inner circle. I think that would be really, really interesting. But nevertheless, I will say I went through this whole movie expecting the killer to be Stu from the first movie. And there's two reasons for that. One, because it's the best conspiracy theory. Second, because there's actually, in season six, they bring back Kirby, and Kirby shows from the FBI all the death dates of all these people. And Stu's has a question mark. So there is a genuine possibility he could come back to the franchise, because why would he have a question mark next to his face? See, I think that would be interesting, especially considering, obviously, in the fifth one, we had Dewey die, the sixth one, again, I think they should have let some characters go. That's all I'm going to say. I think that would have been a perfect trilogy. I think the new characters, I didn't think they needed more development. I think it felt almost obvious in some ways of who the killers were likely going to be. I love them bringing back Kirby. And yeah, the other thing I felt like this one was scared to do is kill old characters. So the cast from Five, some of those had been killed off. And they had the opportunity. What frustrates me is that it would have been a ode to the original Wes Craven series where you had... So Randy dies in the second Scream movie. I think the person who's related to Randy, especially considering it was so hinted at in the first movie, I think it would have been such a foreshadowing to allow them to have been killed off in the second of this new trilogy, is what I like to call it. And they wouldn't fucking do it. I know this is a spoiler, but they didn't kill off a single fucking character from the original five that survived. I think it genuinely let the movie down. This could have been a really, really great movie. All of them from the original franchise, you know, Scream 1, 2, 3, and 4. They had so much great stuff in this movie, and that let it down big time, I feel like. So because of that, I had to give it an 8. IMDb gave it a 6.6. .6. Another Marvel movie, I don't think there's a single other Marvel movie, is Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. First thing you have to know is that Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse is my third favourite movie of all time. I think the soundtrack is incredible, and because of that, this movie's soundtrack was kind of let down a little bit. It did not hit anywhere near as hard as the original. I still listen to the original, I think it's great. So that immediately let me down a little bit. But even the story, I liked that they followed Gwen in this mostly. You got sort of like a half Gwen, half Miles Morales movie. I thought that was really entertaining. I think this is just one of those movies that it struggled from sequel Um I do think the start was a little bit chaotic to the point where the music was so loud you couldn't hear the dialogue perfectly. Like you had to sort of strain. 
got better uh, further in during the movie, but it was something that I heard other people talk about, and it was something that I needed to take note of that, yeah, that was a little bit loud. The story definitely came together. There was quite a few twists that I wasn't expecting. Um, I definitely try to go into movies without expecting twists and turns because otherwise you kind of just ruin it for yourself. So maybe some people did just kind of see those things coming. But the comic book-esque-ness as well of Gwen's world, it was so artistic in nature, beautifully done. The people that created that world did an impeccable job, as with all the Spider-Man universes. The new Spider-Man characters, incredible. Uh, Daniel Kalu Kaluuya? I'm probably butchering that. The guy that plays Hobby Brown, the uh, like punk-looking London Spider-Man. Oh my god, he was so good. He, one of my favourite horror movies is Get Out. I forget how good an actor he is. He's one of those uh, sort of actors that makes me proud to be British and say, this actor comes from my country. He was one of those characters that literally Miles Morales didn't want to like, but you end up loving by the end of the movie. One of the things I didn't definitely like about this movie was they showed all these different Spider-Verses, which I loved seeing all these different Spider-Man, Spider Spider-Mans, all these different Spider-Man characters. I loved seeing that. I thought it was so incredibly creative. But seeing Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield's Spider-Man characters shown, I felt was so unnecessary. We saw so much else. It felt like this was, again, forced in for nostalgia. We already got that movie. I don't understand why that was included. And it was only one tiny little thing, so don't get me wrong, it didn't let the movie down. I saw it and was like, I was annoyed by it. You've got all these other amazing characters. Why? Felt unnecessary. That's just my personal opinion. I will say, obviously, this sets up on a cliffhanger. So maybe that's one of the reasons why I was let down a little bit because the original movie had its final ending and because it did incredibly well, it got a second movie. This movie knew it was going to do well and was already setting up for its fucking third. So because of that, maybe that's what it let it down. I gave this movie an 8.5 and IMDb gave it an 8.9. So we were closer. Now we're going to get back to horror. So Megan, I couldn't get over how much I loved this movie. I actually thought this was going to be higher up on the list. This and a couple of other horrors. Megan was really good. I saw it twice, loved it. I thought she was creepy. She was like, this generation's Chucky to me. And it actually better. The original Chucky movies, I didn't love. I thought they were okay. Similar to like Freddy Krueger, Nightmare on Elm Street. They're not my favorite horror movies. Even Friday the 13th, I'm sorry. I know it's probably a lot of horror movie fans probably fucking hate me for saying that, but they're just not my favourite personally. I prefer Scream and Halloween and things like that. I think Megan is this generation's Chucky. I will say there was a lot of build-up at the start, but I actually liked that. I liked learning and having that build-up because then it was more tense because you knew something was going to happen, you just didn't know when. I liked it. I think for other people it probably, especially considering the fucking score on IMDb, other people may have thought that it took too long to build up to it, but I personally really enjoyed it. The one thing that really let me down, I will say, in this movie was the cringy-ass fucking bulletproof song that was sung. Who thought that was a good idea? I understand maybe singing the key to lullaby or something. Why bulletproof? I don't get it. I like that song. I liked it in Pitch Perfect. Didn't like it here. It felt unnatural. It felt weird. Proper cringy. Loved the first killing of Megan's, by the way. Kid totally fucking deserved it. it. I felt like it was similar to it. I wanted to see who the next people were that she was going to fucking kill. So yeah, so I gave it a 9 out of 10. Mostly because of the cringy song. <laughs> IMDb gave it a 6.4. I thought that was really low. And amazingly, my next one, which is Knock at the Cabin, they gave an even lower score for. So I rewatched this last night and I forgot how much I loved this movie and realised M. Night Shyamalan just does this kind of horror perfectly. For the majority of this movie, there are seven actors in one room and it is still so incredibly tense. Speaking of Dave Bautista as Leonard, I didn't know that actor had such range. He stole the whole entire fucking movie. He showed such warmth and then anger and then sadness and sorrow and intensity. I didn't know he could do that. Incredible. I've only ever seen him in like Guardians of the Galaxy and I think he was in something else. I haven't seen him act like this before and I was really impressed. Something I loved about this movie was, and I think again maybe it's because I'm, I appreciate videography so much, but the slow close-up into the actors' faces to make things feel more uncomfortable to the viewer. The whole screen is literally just like this. Then they have a slight Dutch tilt to them in the next to make you feel immediately uneasy about the situation. I genuinely, this was a movie I had no expectation going into and came out with it being in my top five. This is my fifth 
favourite movie of the year. I actually thought this was going to be higher. It was originally going to be my fourth favourite movie of the year. I really genuinely enjoyed it. It made you think constantly because you didn't know whether these people were crazy. If this was completely true, that there was genuinely an apocalypse about to happen. I loved that. It made you play with it and think, and it made you think constantly of what's actually going on the whole time. M. Night Shyamalan does an incredible job with that. Of course, I forgot to mention, how could I even forget, the kill cam, oh my god, following the axe down. I don't think I've ever seen a shot like that. It was so intense. I loved it. Um, something I will say, I was surprised by how good Rupert Grimm was at playing someone so aggressive. And even though he's only in the movie for a short time, he does a very good job of being so impactful with that role. He goes from being incredibly angry that this is happening to like terrified the intensity of that character all around was very surprising coming from an actor that i've never seen done work like that i know he has probably done work like that i haven't seen him in a movie for a long time and this was refreshing to me all in all i gave this a 9 out of 10 but honestly now i probably would give it a 10 out of 10 the more i've looked at what i've enjoyed this year i probably actually would give this movie a 10 out of 10 now but I want to stick to my rating. IMDb gave this a 6.1. Apparently I'm just alone in my thoughts. Okay, so four. I would have switched these two. Knock at the cabin and this one. Mission Impossible 17... 17? <laughs> it feels like it. Mission Impossible 7, Dead Reckoning Part 1. I couldn't believe how much I fucking enjoyed this movie. From the car chases to the fight scenes, the videography of it, again, was very stunning to me. There are certain directors that just know how to get really impeccable shots. It make me want to be better as a photographer, seriously. The shootouts and fight scenes and everything like that, it gave me John Wick vibes, which I loved about it. You will see why later. The new character introductions and everything I thought were great. The, they really added to the series. There are certain times where ca new characters, you just think, fucking hell, how many characters are you going to keep adding? But actually, I think this franchise is one of the few franchises that consistently gets better and better and better. And considering this is a 27-year-old movie, I was six when the first movie came out, which I didn't even think about that when I wrote that down. <laughs> Although I will say they kind of kissed their own ass in this movie where they had like the, the start of the movie and then when you got to the opening credits, they literally had like a trailer for the fucking movie you were about to see. It was so suck its own dick intro. It was weird. It was like they were trying to be Marvel. Moving on. Something I want to mention really quick as well about Mission Impossible is you have to give it to Tom Cruise. Whether you like Tom Cruise or whether you don't. I think he's a really good actor. I like him in pretty much everything he does. You have to give it to him for his dedication to his stunt work. And I will say very similar to Keanu Reeves later. You have to give it to Tom Cruise. He puts his life at risk constantly. Like hanging off of a fucking moving plane wasn't enough apparently. He needed to jump off a cliff on a bike. But the dedication to, to doing those stunts and getting those shots, like he broke his fucking foot on one of his stunts, jumping off a building. Not in this movie, but in a previous movie. Without a doubt, I think he needs to be shown respect for that. Don't have to respect him in any other way. I think you should respect him for doing his job incredibly well. Which, speaking of, and this is gonna go for a couple of the other movies, there needs to be more Oscars for things like stunt work, not just for Tom Cruise, but for stunt teams, ones for soundtracks, because I don't think they have that any at the moment, but I could be wrong. They should open the Oscars up for things like this. Do they have an Oscar for set design? Because I wrote that down for the next one. I don't know. I don't even know if they have one for, like, wardrobe. My favourite movie of the year has the best wardrobe, I think, personally, out of all of the movies I've seen this year. And that's saying something, considering one of the other movies that I'm going to talk about next. And if they don't, like, they, they really need to open things up to not just supporting actors or main actors, but things like that, because a lot of work and dedication is put into these things to make them look the way they do, sound the way they do. Musical scores, and not it's not just one song. Like, for example, in the Barbie movie, you're immediately going to think, oh, the Dua Lipa song. But there are whole soundtracks, like Guardians of the Galaxy, for example, or, like I say, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, that should be recognised. Anyway, I've gone off on a tangent. My point is, stunt work is so impressive and should be recognised as such whether it's the stunt team or the actor doing the stunt work. Overall, I gave this movie a 9.5. IMDb gave it an 8. Okay, next movie. 
This is so surprising to me. The next three movies, I gave every single one of them 10 out of 10. So you know they're all really, really good movies, at least to me. And considering the other two movies is a horror and an action movie, which you can probably already guess what they are, this was shocking that I liked this not only better than Oppenheimer, but the third favourite movie I've watched this year. And that's Barbie. Now, look at me with my like grunge emo vibe, right? I don't look like someone that would fucking watch Barbie. I genuinely really, really, really liked it. I went in with low expectations of I'll probably think it's like entertaining nothing as special as everyone else is making out. And I didn't really have Barbies as a kid. I only remember maybe having one and I don't even really remember playing with it. But this movie hit so well on was, first of all, it was fun. It was a fun, very peeling looking movie. And by peeling, I mean the set design, the wardrobe, everything was very nice to look at. I thought this was going to be a one dimensional movie. It wasn't. There were so many hidden layers and real life metaphors to this movie to the point where the second that Barbie gets into the real world she feels uncomfortable because she feels like she's constantly being looked at by men and sexualized by men and that is literally how women feel in the world at all fucking times which side note a guy smacked her on the ass she punched him in the face but she's the one who got taken not the guy who sexually assaulted her That is how bad it is. I could talk about this movie for a really long time. I feel like I want to make a breakdown video. I really don't want to do this to myself. Ben Shapiro has made three fucking videos about the Barbie movie, slating it. I would actually like to just watch them. I think I would like to counteract, in my point of view, why I think likely the opposite of what he does. I feel like the only thing that I didn't even think about it at the time, that's how much this is kind of forgettable to me because these characters, in a way, are kind of forgettable. The Will Ferrell office lot that follow and chase Barbie, I think that that was sort of mentioned by Jeremy Johns that they felt like caricatures, they felt out of place in the real world, they felt like they were from Barbie world but in the real world or whatever. Yeah, they are kind of a bit caricature-esque compared to the rest of the movie in the real world. I didn't think their comedy bits landed, Ken's definitely did, Um, like the beach off bit so fucking funny i was sitting there giggling constantly the movie's self-awareness as well i think was really funny like for example there's a point where they have this like heartfelt message of margot robbie's barbie saying like oh i feel you know ugly or whatever and helen mirren who's the narrator why people didn't recognize helen mirren i don't know i'm not stereotypical barbie pretty note to the filmmakers margot robbie is the wrong person to cast if you want to make this point although people calling their mid Anyway, all in all, I really, really enjoyed this movie. I like movies that have hidden metaphor, real life especially, metaphor to them. Because I think they're more impactful. I feel it more. And something like this, Barbie, my two favourite movies, The Joker, I felt so much hidden meta- real life metaphor within The Joker. Especially with like the police riots and things like that. And my favourite movie that no one talks about, Snowpiercer, the poor versus the rich, and them having to fight for what is, and riot basically, to get what they deserve. Very much giving France vibe. I've always enjoyed movies that have that hidden meaning to them way more, and I feel like I'm a second watch of Barbie, which I guarantee I will watch this again. Because of that hidden meaning that meant so much to me as a woman in this age, I gave it a 10 out of 10 because of that. And IMDb gave it a 7.5 which is, fuck me, it's low considering all the hype. My top two. I actually thought this movie was going to be the top movie. And when I was thinking about it, they were were going in between constantly. I had to top number one to the other movie. Number two, Evil Dead Rise. This is my favourite horror movie of the year. To the point where I have a list of movies that I want to make a tattoo sleeve. This is being added in, 100 million percent. I loved it, which... Is surprising in a little way because some of the characters I wanted to smack around the fucking face. For example, having there be an earthquake and going into a fucking bank vault and picking something out which is clearly should stay where the hell it is. Like, unless you're going to a bank vault and grabbing cash, don't grab creepy books. Don't do it. I really, really liked it. I thought it was tense and gripping and it had a nod to the original Evil Dead movie of Ash with the chainsaw. Loved that. So I think it paid tribute to the original, which makes sense because 
the actor that plays Ash was part of the making, he was the director and the producer on this movie, so it 100% makes sense. I think it showed the Dutch tilt to make things feel uneasy. So Dutch tilt, if you don't know, something I mentioned earlier, is where the shot is slightly ajar. Same shot, but at a slightly adjusted angle. It makes you feel uneasy because you don't know what's about to happen. Some movies use it way too much and it loses its impactfulness. When you use it sparingly, it causes that intensity. I will say some of the best moments were sort of seen in the trailer. But once I'd seen it more than once, I sort of forgot which parts were in the trailer and just enjoyed the movie. <laughs> Something this movie does incredibly well, which it's hard to find. And this doesn't have any jump scares in it. It has no stingers. And that movie stinger is that noise to alert you that you should be scared. It doesn't do that because it doesn't need to. That's one of the things I loved about this. It was so fucking dark in this movie. And it made me, when I got home the first time I saw it, I had to sleep with the light on because it was scary enough for me to be like, what's going to come out of the shadows? Which, speaking of, Alyssa Sutherland, I've only seen her in the TV version of The Mist, which I still like. I've rewatched it a couple of times. I didn't know someone so absolutely fucking stunning could be so incredibly creepy. <laughs> She, in the start of the movie, is stunning, breathtaking, gorgeous. Like, every shot of her is like a fucking model photo. She's absolutely stunning. And then she turns into whatever the thing's called, which, by the way, the start of the movie, I thought, being, like, actually the end of the movie, was actually a nice way to start it as well. Some people didn't like it. They thought it was a bit lightless. Uh, but I actually quite liked that stuff. I thought it was refreshing, especially to the Evil Dead franchise. It's something they hadn't done before. Cabin in the Woods is normally what the Evil Dead does, and it started with that, but that actually wasn't the full point of the movie, which I liked. The person that plays her sister, Lily Sullivan, does a really, really, really good job. She plays Beth. Both Alyssa Sutherland and Lily Sullivan. That's really confusing. An incredible job. You will remember Alyssa Sutherland, obviously, more than, more than Lily, but because she is the darkness of the creature. I will say, again, give it to her. She did quite a few of her stunts herself. I saw her showing how a lot of these stunts were done. Really impressive that she got so involved. And the amount of gore as well, the amount of blood that they were covered in. I'm pretty sure Evil Dead is the most blood, fake blood obviously, used in any franchise. They stuck true to that. So I gave this obviously a 10 out of 10 and IMDb gave it a 6.6, .6, which I'm really surprised about. And then my absolute number one has to go to John Wick chapter four. Now, I love John Wick movies. I've always loved them. I love Keanu Reeves, but this movie hit different, I feel like, to the previous couple of John Wick movies. John Wick movies have always, again, been one of those franchises that have gotten better and better and better. This was no exception. The lighting, and set design of this movie, every single shot was like art. It was like a photograph. You could have taken any single fucking picture or snapshot of any single part of this movie. It was perfection. The fight scene, I can't even. They were just so incredibly good. The new characters that were introduced, which Akita, who was a badass female, which I hope she gets a spin-off. I actually liked her better than Halle Berry's character. I think it's the previous movie. Mr. Nobody, he deserves a fucking spin-off. I think he stole every scene he was in because I think he was that good. He was charismatic. And he was what I remembered. Bar, Bill Skarsgård, who again, oh my god, his wardrobe was... Like, if you weren't attracted to Bill Skarsgård before this movie, you are from this movie. Even though he wasn't as intense a villain as some other villains have been throughout John Wick, there was something about him. And that is obviously the Bill Skarsgård effect. Which again, this movie deserves an award for the stunt team. Because without them, there is no John Wick movie. And that would be a shame because I think they are the best action series franchise that is out right now. I think every movie that is doing any sort of fight scene, gun scene, anything like that, they are taking notes from John Wick and you are lying to yourself if you think they aren't. That's how good this franchise is. I will say it is surprising that even though this is a Keanu movie, Keanu doesn't really say that much throughout this whole movie. I wouldn't be surprised if he had less than 20 words of dialogue. At the very least, 20 fucking sentences. I will say I saw that ending coming. I didn't see what happened to John Wick happening, but it makes sense for the movie the way this to go 
and I think having spin-offs prequel to like Halle Berry's character I'm pretty sure they're doing that and I think that's great I think that's a good way for this to go like I said there's so many great characters in John Wick movies also the character that plays the blind guy Johnny Yen who plays Kane who is a blind assassin again I would love to see a prequel or at least a side movie of him that's what John Wick's franchise does great there are quite a lot of characters now but it never feels over inflated it feels well made and well intersected I think John Wick does something that a lot of movies and franchises wish they could do even Marvel levels and I know that's saying a lot but Marvel's getting fucking busy with characters and like I say, they could do with just killing people off and not fucking bringing them back because it is getting way too messy over there. Also, sorry, I forgot to mention, IMDb gave John Wick a 7.8. What is wrong with them? Let me know what you guys think of my list. Do you agree with some of my opinions? Do you not? Let me know in a comment. If you want me to make a full breakdown of Barbie, because I made so many notes during that movie, let me know. Like I said, if you want me to break down um, or react to Ben Shapiro's reactions to Barbie or whatever, let me know. But yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, make sure to give this a like and subscribe if you feel like it, I'd really appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed the video. Bye!